Selamat datang. Welcome to Malaysia. An exotic world located in the Far East, full of tradition and history. A fascinating country that also boasts rare wildlife and a colorful underwater world. Peninsula Malaysia, pure Asia, situated between Thailand and Singapore. We begin our journey in Malacca. This, the oldest city on the southwest coast of the peninsula, has 600 years of history and took a major part in the founding of Malaysia. Both Portuguese and Jesuit settlers lived here for 130 years and introduced their culture to this region. The city's history dates back to 1403 when Hindu prince Parameswari of the Sri Vijaya realm in Sumatra established a sultanate here. In 1641, the Dutch followed the Portuguese and for 154 years ruled from the Stadhuis in Malacca. The tiny Malacca River wound its way through the city, or to put it another way, the city evolved along the river from which its wealth was derived. And from here, courageous seafarers plied their trade with the Orient. The Chinese-dominated area of the city extends across the opposite banks of the river where the mainly two-story residential and business premises are densely packed together. The Zhang Hun Temple is one of the oldest temples in Malaysia. And nearby is the Kampung Kling Mosque, which is of ancient Sumatran design. The former ascent of a tiny pirate's retreat into that of a sultan's prosperous trading port, and from where various rulers of the seas turned Malacca into a place of history, truly became the cradle of Malaysia. Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia's modern capital city, is relatively young. It originated from the middle of the 19th century at the junction of two rivers. Chinese pioneers discovered an abundance of minerals here. Since then, however, things have much improved and Kuala Lumpur is now one of the cleanest cities in the world, with two steel towers as its unmistakable landmark, connected by an impressive bridge. Just a few minutes away, the contrast couldn't be greater, a Malaysian village. In Kampung Baru, chickens freely cross the street and the local people live in well-ordered houses and enjoy a calm way of life. No hustle and bustle here. In the background are tall skyscrapers and a television mast overlooks this traditional village set within the city. The old Majid Jamek Mosque is situated in the center of the city, on the junction of the Gombak and Kilang rivers, at the precise spot where the city was founded. Located on a tongue of land formed by both rivers amid the city's skyscrapers, it's a sacred place that's extremely popular with the faithful. Several prayer halls and an inner courtyard that contains palm trees make the mosque a tranquil oasis. Merdeka Square, the Square of Independence, is at the colonial heart of the city. In 1957, the Union Jack was replaced by the Malaysian flag. Each of the buildings around the square was influenced by the architecture of the Mughals, combined with Victorian design.
The splendid Sultan Abdul Samad building was designed in 1897 by architect A.C. Norman with onion-shaped towers and a central clock tower. The place where once colonial administration was conducted is now the courts of justice. At the southern end of the square are two small colonial administrative buildings that have been transformed into museums. Particularly impressive are the futuristic looking mix of traditional building materials of steel and glass. A small white building is located on the northern edge of the square, St. Mary's Cathedral, a Victorian design. Following Sunday Mass, the British colonial community ventured through the tropical heat to a nearby club. Music has always played an important role in Malaysia's religious ceremonies, as well as being an essential ingredient in traditional dance forms and shadow puppet theatre. Malaysians dance at every opportunity. Although traditional clothing and dance styles change from region to region, they always convey the same expressions. Love, emotion and passion. A little surprising, the main Hindu temple is situated in Chinatown. The Sri Maha Mariaman temple, dedicated to the goddess of rain, Mariaman. The Hindu gods ride, dance and meditate in colorful paintings above the entrance to the temple as well as within. Each day, faithful Hindus bring garlands of flowers and other items to honor the gods, always assisted by holy men. Mariamman is worshipped in order to protect against disease and misfortune. Many other gods are also worshipped here. Built in 1880, one of the city's oldest Chinese places of worship is the Tsi Yao Temple that is located close to the central markets in Chinatown. The temple is said to have been founded by a Chinaman, Captain Yap Ah Lo, and the lighting of fumigants is believed to bring financial success. In the 19th century, many Chinese immigrated here as their homeland was rife with war. Soon they controlled both trade and industry. However, in addition to their economic success, the Chinese have always been a devout people and their temples are usually kept very busy. Little remains of the Chinatown of old. Most of the city's typical shop houses, buildings with shops on the ground floor and apartments on the upper floor, have since made way for modern buildings. Only a few of the older buildings have survived the building boom of recent years. A monorail is the city's most recent mode of transport. It provides a good overground view of the city. A futuristic city needs a well-thought-out transport system. So the separation of the monorail from the main traffic routes proved to be a good decision. The city's inhabitants are used to their elevated trains. For them, only one thing is important, the expansion of the city. They're proud of their newly built skyscrapers, city districts and contemporary transport systems. Set high in the south of the city is the Istana Negara, the official residence of Yang de Putuan Agong, King of Malaysia. This building was originally the residence of a wealthy Chinaman, but in 1926 it was transformed into the palace of the Sultans of Silangor. It's protected by guards in shining white uniforms. The representative head of Malaysia is elected by the country's 13 sultans. They always select one of their own and he reigns for five years.
A breathtaking spectacle of color greets those who visit the elevated Tian Ho Temple that is situated close to the royal palace. The faithful are welcomed in the courtyard by the numerous images of various gods. This temple is also popular for wedding ceremonies. Each post of this splendid temple complex was donated by a number of Chinese multi-millionaires. Its construction was extremely costly. The city's inhabitants come here to worship the goddess Kuai Yin and pray for wealth and good fortune. It seems that many of the prayers have been answered, judging by the fine skyscrapers of this impressive city. And everywhere, sacrifices are offered. Here, religion is part of the everyday life of the people. The view above the city's many beautiful golden roofs is quite unique. It's not surprising that Tian Ho is one of the most beautiful temples in Asia. The station dates back to 1910 and is one of the city's most famous buildings. With its cupolas and minarets, it's more like a sultan's palace. British architect A.B. Hubbock was responsible for its design. According to Victorian building regulations, the roof had to be built strong enough to support one meter of snow. In this tropical climate, this seemed a mite overcautious. On Bukit Nanas, Pineapple Hill, is the Manara KL. In 1996, it was the third highest tower in the world and the tallest in Asia. Hardly any other capital city on earth offers as many contrasting sights and multicultural impressions. Tradition, history, the past and the future, each one is united here. Close to the capital are the Batu Caves, a central place of culture for Malaya's Hindus. 272 steps lead up to the huge limestone caves above. In 1879, they became world famous when American explorer William Hornaby was shown the cave system by the local people. Soon afterwards, the caves were consecrated as Hindu temples. And since then, many of the faithful come here to sacrifice flowers and to visit the shrine of Subramanayam. Through a rock chimney, daylight penetrates one of the up to 100 meter deep dripstone caves that form a labyrinth. On our journey north to the Cameron Highlands, we encounter one of the country's last remaining basket makers. Once there were more than 30, but today, only three. They produce the material by hand with some assistance from machines. Handcrafts have a long tradition here. The winding road travels higher and higher and we stop at Lata Iskandar, a huge waterfall of which the water is most refreshing. The water masses plunge down in spectacular fashion. Here in the tropical rainforest mountains, waterfalls are commonplace, yet there's also an abundance of rain. After negotiating further bends in the road, the first huts of the Orang Aslai appear a tribe that has inhabited this remote area for centuries. They proudly demonstrate their traditional tribal clothing and perform their hunting skills with a blow tube, a skill mastered by each male member of the tribe. Orang Asli, the original people, are the indigenous inhabitants of the island who live in the remoteness of the forests.
Finally, we reach Ringlet, the first large settlement of the Cameron Highlands. At first sight, Ringlet looks like a small town that could be situated virtually anywhere. It has a marketplace in which the vegetables, fruit, fresh food and fish are offered for sale. Not long ago, this was a natural wilderness. On the banks of a small water reservoir is the idyllic lake house, a typical English country house, set in the highlands. Wealthy colonial landlords once sheltered here from the scorching hot summers of the lowlands. Although the sky is often covered by cloud and it rains almost every day. Since 1926, tea has been cultivated in the Cameron Highlands. The mild and rainy climate is ideal for its growth. British surveyor William Cameron discovered this region in 1885 and soon afterwards its wooded hills were transformed into tea plantations that now attract tourists from all over the world. Around 13 kilometers away and hundreds of meters higher is Tanarata, the main town of the Cameron Highlands. Here, there are numerous administrative buildings, a police force and a hospital. The small town is surrounded by tea plantations, as well as modern hotel complexes and holiday villages. The road continues higher and higher into the hilly landscape. This remote region contains a well-known tea destination, the Bo Tea Center. It is situated within a huge plantation. The tea story of the Highlands began in 1929 when young Britisher John Archibald Russell recognized that the region's climate and landscape were perfect for the cultivation of tea. Luscious green tea bushes cover the hills. The harvest continues throughout the year and the tea that is cultivated here supplies the whole of Malaysia. Originally, the workers here came from India and settled on the tea plantations. Brin Chang is the final destination of our tour through the highlands, the Green Centre. Here there are a number of show farms that are open to the public, such as that of Cactus Valley. features a large variety of remarkable cactus plants, some of which are 60 years old. The Rose Center covers a hilltop. Ten wide levels lead up to the main vantage point. And everywhere, there are roses, more than a hundred species. A further attraction of this tourist centre is the Butterfly Garden, a paradise for those interested in blossoms and butterflies. Numerous exotic butterflies can be seen here. They're attracted to the various scents and blossoms. We also appreciate the tropical splendor of the blossom. Back in the lowlands, we visit Kelly's Castle on our journey to the north of the peninsula. A Scottish millionaire planned to have a second home built here, but it remained incomplete. William Kelly Smith became prosperous due to the mining of tin and the production of rubber. In 1915, construction of his fantasy castle began. He 
He wanted it to be a magnificent building with Moorish windows, towers, halls, wine cellars and secret corridors. But before it was completed, Kelly passed away. Prior to reaching Ipoh, we visit the Chinese and Buddhist cave temples of Sampotong. Its facade and buildings give no hint of what lies within. But inside the huge dripstone caves, temples were built, along with several altars and gilded deities. A Chinese monk discovered these adjoining caves. There are also open-air temple complexes, ideal for peace and contemplation. Ipoh is the third largest city in Malaysia. It's located on the main railroad between north and south, and its station is like a shining white palace. The city was founded more than a hundred years ago during the tin boom. The largest tin deposits in the world brought much prosperity here. Located in the center of the old town is the state mosque and opposite a clock tower. The city grew rapidly and religious tolerance went without question. The former wealth of this city of millionaires is still evident today by the city's former splendid colonial buildings that are gradually being renovated. Here there were once almost 500 tin mines that employed 80,000 workers. So thousands of Chinese poured into the country. The river Kinta divides the city between the old and new town, in which the newly arrived Chinese once settled. Further north, we reach Kuala Kangsa, a city in which Englishman Hugh Lowe planted the first natural rubber tree outside Brazil. It's also known as the Regal City because since 1887, it's been the seat of the Sultan of Pirak. He resides in the Istana Iskandaraya Palace. One of the main sites is the splendid Ubudaya Mosque, the most impressive mosque in Malaysia. Its golden cupola is flanked by four tall minarets. The interior is quite modest. Built in 1913 and designed by an Indian architect, its facade is like something from a fairy tale. The old Istana Kanangan Palace is one of only a few traditional Malaysian residences. It's constructed totally of wood and is supported unnailed by 60 posts. Today, Kuala Kangsa is a place of education. The legacy of its British colonial masters was gradually adapted and merged with traditional values. Knowledge and education is power on the long journey to contemporary life. Also in nearby Taiping, the mining of tin attracted workers from China and India from the middle of the 19th century. So the city grew and grew. In the former capital of the federal state of Pirak, there is no sign today of the conflicts of the various secret societies of the mine workers who once quarreled over mining rights. Only a tiny cemetery. The generously laid out park complex of Lake Gardens bears no hint of the abandoned tin mines that were once so active here. Today it's covered by arcades and small bridges. The large park contains Taiping Zoo, the oldest animal park in Malaysia. 
A small train travels past elephants and flamingos. The park obtained many of its ideas from various other zoos and created this wonderful wildlife sanctuary with fine enclosures and a splendid nocturnal safari. The city's inhabitants appreciate their zoo that also contains many indigenous animals. Further north, we travel on the Eastern and Oriental Express, a nostalgic train journey with all the exotic atmosphere of colonial times. The wagons of the E and O originate from New Zealand, where they were in service until 1980 as the Silver Star. In the luxurious restaurant car, passengers are well pampered. And three different types of cabin are available, each with air conditioning, shower and WC. Beautiful wooden panels decorate both walls and ceilings, and there's a good selection of elegant chairs in the bar and club wagons. The service is exquisite. There's a staff of around 45 to attend to the needs of 130 passengers. In the restaurant car, beverages are served, and in the well-equipped kitchen, the head chef oversees the preparation of the delicious menu. Euro-Asian cuisine with local fresh produce. A first-class hotel on rails. Next, the diligent stewards transform the cabin's comfortable seats into beds. And in the piano bar, the evening's music and dancing begin. Next morning, the landscape has changed. Green hills and endless rice fields make up this exotic region. The train moves slowly to our next destination. Butterworth marks the end of the train journey. From here, we take a ferry boat to an island. Pulau Penang, the Pearl of the Orient. Various bicycle rickshaws await their passengers outside Clan Haas. In the 19th century, this is where the country's new immigrants arrived. The Clan organization provided immigrants with accommodation and employment, and also assisted them with contacts and even arranged funerals and memorials for the deceased. The adjoining temple is richly decorated with reliefs, illustrations and text of which an explanation is provided by friendly guides. The Ku family were among the first to settle in Penang and their ancestral gallery indicates their long history and commercial success. The rickshaw drivers are at the ready. Finally, the time has come. They line up in predetermined style and the tour commences. Here, the unique magic and magnificence of bygone Asia have survived in full. Entire streets appear just as they did a century and a half ago. Our journey travels past Victorian buildings, Chinese shops, Indian temples and Malaysian mosques. the noble Eastern and Oriental Hotel that was once owned by the Sakis brothers, the most successful hoteliers in colonial Asia. Sarawak is located in Borneo, the third largest island in the world. We start our journey through this Malayan federal state in the northwest of the island, in the capital, Kuching. In recent years, the city of Katz has seen much growth and modernization. 
However, the old town has retained its Chinese character, but there are no traces of cats. Its name originated due to a misunderstanding. Chinese settlers once took part in a revolt against the Sultan of Brunei, who owned Sarawak. When British adventurer James Brooke sailed here, he managed to settle the argument, and consequently, the various cultures and religions of the region continued harmoniously under his supervision. Today, Islam is the country's main religion, as is highlighted by the relatively new and imposing National Mosque. This hill became a cemetery. The produce displayed in the market is extensive. Vegetables and fruit, meat and fish, and it's all very fresh. The Sarawak River divides the city in two, and on one of its banks are the buildings of Kampung Boyan, an old water town. Situated on a hill is Fort Margarita, a fortress that dates back to 1841. And behind it is the new and contemporary seat of government. On the opposite side of the river is the waterfront, which is located outside the actual city and its large hotels. There's a promenade and also boat trips across the river. On this side of the river is an unimportant looking building. And a monument serves as a reminder of the time of the white Rajas who once reigned here. This peaceful land delighted the Sultan, so he presented Brook with Sarawak. In 1888, the British Crown took power. The British Empire had various buildings constructed in Kuching, but its ethnic groups were content to remain within their own surroundings. The city's industrial prosperity is plain to see from a boat on the Sarawak River and the South China Sea isn't very far away. On board, dance adds to the pleasant evening atmosphere as the ship returns to the glimmering waterfront. Close to Kuching is a national institution that is popular with nature lovers from around the world. First, a short explanation. Then we enter their territory, that of the forest people, a rehabilitation center for orangutans. In Semongo, both wild and orphaned orangutans are taught how to adapt to survival in the forest. They're given food and hide in the treetops. During feeding time, the animals can be observed and photographed. Most of the time, they're well camouflaged high up in the trees. Little by little, the animal handlers reaccustom the orangutan to their natural habitat. Our next trip leads through the jungle. To a village of the Bidayum tribe and to the border of the South Indonesian section of the island. The tribe continues to live in traditional longhouses and survives from agriculture and river fishing. The village is situated close to the riverbank. Outside their dwellings, grain is laid out to dry. It's a common sight here.
The longhouses measure up to 150 meters in length and are inhabited by several families. The enclosed porch in front of the living areas serves as a general living space. Daily life takes place outside and as a family unit. The Sarawak Cultural Village is a splendid project that provides a good insight into the Sarawak tribal life and indicates still further the cultures that exist in Borneo. The museum village is located within a large natural area and is divided according to ethnic groups. Their post houses can also be visited. Amicable members of the tribes show off their colorful festive clothing as well as their weaving skills. The traditional settlements of various tribes have been built around a lake and several times a day a sparsely dressed hunter demonstrates the art of blowpipe hunting. The Melanau like it high, and their high house is situated on decorated wooden pillars at the height of the treetops and can only be reached via a large number of wooden steps. This tropical region is typical of Borneo with much water, dense vegetation and an abundance of flowers. The variety of building styles is an impressive sight. Dance performances in the large community theatre are a highlight of the day. Each ethnic group demonstrates its numerous dances and clothing. Everything reflects daily life. Each dance, movement and gesture has a special meaning and the variety of dances is quite amazing. Bidayu, Orangulu, Miranao, Malam and Sina. Each of these tribes has retained its ethnic identity and lives together in harmony. But this is typical of the country as a whole. The journey to the Damai coast travels past traditional buildings built on posts and lush green scenery. The Damai region is located on the eastern side of a small peninsula in the north of Kuching, a very remote coastal area with sandy beaches and palm trees. Indeed, the land here is so untouched that palm trees which have been uprooted by tropical storms still lie on the beach. The colors of the South China Sea are truly fascinating. So it's hardly surprising that international tourism is all set to discover this exotic paradise. Sabah, the land beneath the wind, situated in the northeast of Borneo. Its capital is Kota Ginabalu. Up until the 19th century, the Sultan of Sulk and the Sultan of Brunei ruled over this remote region. At that time, European colonial rulers took power, and since 1963, Sabah has formed part of Malaysia. In the Kampung Warisan Open Air Museum, the city's inhabitants have the opportunity to learn of their traditional roots. 11 traditional huts of various ethnic groups such as Murut, Bajau and Karazan are situated around a lake. Kota Kinabalu has no hint of colonialism because the original town of Jesselton was completely destroyed during World War II and almost all of its buildings have been rebuilt. Within the city center is the wetland center, a small section of the original wetland area upon which the old town was constructed on posts.
The remaining few buildings of the water town are supported by posts in the sea and are accessible by wooden planks. The beautiful city beach with its neat promenade is very popular with the local people. The large Majid Nigara is a typical example of modern Islamic architecture. The most modern mosque in Malaysia can accommodate 5,000 worshippers. During the day, fishing boats lie at anchor in the harbour. In the evening, the fishermen embark on their nocturnal journey and in the morning deliver fresh produce to the markets. Due to the scorching daytime heat, the harbour's night market is a popular meeting place. Several market stalls sell fish and other seafood in the open air. Next to the market in the Pasar Kratagan, more goods are displayed. Small kitchens offer countless tasty dishes and there's a good variety of local fruit and vegetables. A real joy for the senses. In the early morning, we travel about 200 kilometers south into the hilly land of the Murut. Close to Tenom, the Malayan government created a park in which the country's flora is on show in all of its glory. In the center of Tamam Pertanian, is a lake around which grow many varieties of plant. Trading ships from all over the world once transported rubber trees, coffee, cocoa and oil palms, as well as a large number of exotic flowers. But the remarkable variety available is so vast that this park alone and its various gardens are unable to display so many flowers. Next, a real adventure is about to begin. A journey on a small train from Tinom to Bangui. The diesel engine is fueled. Women in carriages, men in open goods wagons. The line follows the Das River that flows to the open sea. At the Bangui terminal, the diesel engine is connected to the opposite end and the return journey begins. The water level constantly rises and in a few hours' time, Tinom station will be flooded for several days. We've been fortunate indeed. Now we go on the search for traces of history. The Monsopiad cultural village was named after the legendary warrior of the Karazan Dusan tribe. It's an idyllic setting on the banks of the Putatan River. The colorful museum village features a tribe that lived 300 years ago. Here, visitors can delve into the spiritual world of a bygone age. There are customs and traditions, stories of the headhunter, Monsopiad, and the female high priest who once ruled the village. The tranquility of this place now is so different from the living conditions of those distant times. In a communal building, a dance show is performed. The Sumazal dance from Pinampan, the Mongiogol Sumandai from Kudat in the north, and also the Angalang Mangunatip from Tinom in the south. Each dance of the various Saba tribes. Describing daily life from hunting to ritual ceremonies. But the highlight is the house of skulls outside the village where 42 human skulls are stored beneath a roof. The 
Hanso Piad is said to have hunted the village's enemies, and the many heads demonstrate the extraordinary courage of the great warrior. The Lok Kawi Wild Animal Park in the south of Kuching is one of the most modern and best laid out animal parks in the region, a tribute to Borneo's animal kingdom. A herd of small elephant inhabits this large area, and several young show that they're well and truly at home here. The rare sun bear also lives here. Orangutans are also content, although there are no jungle trees to entertain them. The Banteng cow is not disturbed by the group of gibbon monkeys that swing from one tree branch to the next. But the park's biggest attraction is the proboscis monkeys that are rarely seen in the wilderness. Active during the day, the proboscis monkey lives only in Borneo, where it inhabits the coast and lowlands. Only the male has this large, cucumber-shaped nose. A Malayan tiger watches the small train that travels through the park and experienced staff members of the zoo explain the work that is being done for the orangutan. These peaceful bran apes live in the jungle and are the closest relatives of man in the animal kingdom. While seated upright in the water, devouring fish, large otters entertain onlookers. In the northeast of Sabah is the majestic Mount Kinabalu. At 13,432 feet above sea level, the highest mountain between the Himalayas and New Guinea. It rises from the tropical lowland jungle up to the sparse granite regions. The huge national park extends around the mountain. The dense flora of almost every climatic zone can be found here, from tropical vegetation in the plains to alpine flora, a unique variety from around the world. Many varieties of orchid and other tropical plants are to be found in the botanical mountain garden. A round trip provides us with a good insight into the park. Only here grows the Rafflesia, the largest flower in the world. It grows in a year, blossoms for a week, and weighs nine kilograms. Air Panaporing is situated at the edge of the park. It's a place of relaxation. During wartime occupation, Japanese soldiers dug out hot sulfur spring basins within the lowland jungle. Some years ago, as a further attraction, a canopy walkway was built. A row of chain bridges at the height of the treetops. And on narrow wooden planks, we walk above the deep abyss below. A nearby waterfall provides a refreshing vista. Ecotourism has featured here for some time. The journey ends in the extreme southeast of Sabah on Pular Sipadan, a small island just off the coast. It features a paradise like underwater world. Like a slim rock needle, the volcano's summit towers up from the water's surface 600 meters high, and a coral reef has formed a mushroom like head. This, the only Malayan island in the ocean, is like a living treasure trove of sea life. Here live sea animals of all kinds in well-protected surroundings.
the steeply sloping walls of the reef are their living space. For many divers from all over the world, this is one of the most beautiful diving areas in the world. Borneo is a country of natural wonder, full of adventure, a land of headhunters, mysterious cultures and exotic wildlife. An island far off the main tourist trail, a hidden paradise set amid the South China Sea. Malaysia is like a magnificent fairy tale, a melting pot of various cultures and ethnic groups amid abundant tropical vegetation. Although Malaysia has changed, it hasn't forgotten the rich traditions of its indigenous tribes. Yet it is now a country that is traveling into a new age.